Hey there, I'm James, host of Dakota Spotlight. We're back with a new season, You Killed Chris, A Friend's Fight for Justice. It's a chilling throwback to 1968. A college freshman, Christine Rothschild, is murdered on campus during her morning walk. Join us as we dive into this unsolved case and follow a friend's relentless pursuit of the truth, all the way from the flower power era to today. Binge You Killed Chris on your favorite app or at dakotaspotlight.com. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your jobs projects done well. If you own a home, you know how much work it can take, whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality. It can be hard just to know where to start, but now all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. Angie has over 20 years of home service experience, and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app, answer a few questions, and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish or help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Because when it comes to getting the most out of your home, you can do this when you Angie that. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. Mall Madness. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. two Providence Place mall security guards were making the rounds, checking stores and corridors for any suspicious dealings or actions. When they decided to turn a corner they hadn't been down before, they opened a door at the end of a lower corridor. What they would find would shock them. A secret, ramshackle space, one that was lived in for seemingly years by many. Hell, it even had silverware, a bed, a TV, a PlayStation. Welcome to the Secret Mall Apartment, the subject of this week's Ghost Town. How an artist collective decided to develop the developer and set up shop in the belly of the enemy, their local mall. On the bank of the Wunesquatucket River, I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, in downtown Provincetown is the Providence Place Mall, an attempt back in 1999 to revitalize the city. The construction plan budgeted $500 million to realize the mall, a hyper-regional, one-stop shopping destination that celebrated Providence's identity and history. And commerce, of course. Always commerce. Artist Michael Townsend lived nearby, observing the construction on his daily runs as the mall became a neighborhood reality. He felt good about the project, especially with the emphasis on helping local businesses. On his runs, one particular part of the mall's construction caught Townsend's eye. Among Among the flurry of contractors and workers... One area seemed kind of dead. Townsend observed two giant walls that almost touched, but not quite. He remembered thinking to himself, Why isn't that just one wall? Why would you build two walls with enough space to squeeze through them? When he dared investigate, Townsend realized that beyond the two walls was an unused space, but it didn't seem to be storage or parking. Townsend didn't know what to make of this space, an accidental room that, according to 99% Invisible, was a room in the guts of the building that only existed by virtue of the intentionally designed rooms around it. Four years later, in 2003, a second group of developers descended upon Providence. At that point, Townsend lived with several other artists in a building called Fort Thunder, a live workspace set in an old textile factory in the area. These developers used a specialized computer algorithm to figure out the best place in the area to develop. And unfortunately for Townsend and his roommates, that spot was Fort Thunder. Townsend would end up spending the next two years fighting alongside his artistic colleagues and friends to save Fort Thunder and the outlying area from the developer's plan to tear down all the buildings and replace them with more retail. Townsend lost this battle, unfortunately, and saw Fort Thunder replaced with a parking lot. Needless to say, the community was not happy. But the community also felt powerless. So this is the backdrop for Townsend's next move, to dismantle the revitalization and gentrification efforts by the city, by infiltrating its ranks, guerrilla style. To this end, Townsend and his old roommates made a plan. They would live in the mall for one week without leaving, to understand what they were up against, and then, you know, go from there. 
In part, the the live-in-the-mall plan was an effort to gain more control over their surroundings, to take up space, to assert that spaces like the mall belong just as much to the common people as the developers. So, of course, when they needed a space, any space, Townsend thought of that bizarre accidental room he'd encountered at the Providence Place Mall so many years before. It was also somewhat invited by the Providence Mall itself, at least according to Townsend. Quote, Over Christmas 2003, radio ads for the Providence Place Mall featured an enthusiastic female voice talking about how great it would be if you could live at the mall, explained Townsend. The central theme of the ads was that the mall not only provided a rich shopping experience, but also had all the things that one would need to survive and lead a healthy life. They wanted to be there. And the mall, well, it clearly challenged community members to make a life out of their 13-acre space. Challenge accepted. When the group scouted the mall space between the two cinder block walls, they discovered it had never been sealed off, a refuge beneath an I-beam and above an unused dusty storage room in the parking garage. Though there were ways in through the mall itself, the room was almost a private time capsule, tall and wide, 750 square feet, on this kind of second floor level, filled with remnants from the mall's construction six years earlier. Think broken two-by-fours, screws, plastic zip ties, and other debris. Quote, it was big, Townsend remembers. It was a big space that served no other purpose. It wasn't a storefront, and it wasn't a stairwell. It was just big. Townsend and his friends decided to think bigger than a week, and effectively began turning the unused space into their own personal long-term apartment. First, they cleared the debris, carrying it out in backpacks through the mall itself. Without running water or electricity, the group hauled in gallon jugs of water for drinking and cleaning, and clamp lights and extension cords for illumination, which they plugged into the mall's internal power system. They even built a cinder block wall to hide the space from anyone else who might venture in from various other potential mall entrances. They then furnished the place to make it a home, including adding a love seat, a coffee table, a television, a breakfast table, four chairs, lamps, a throw rug, and lots of art. Many of these items were from the mall itself, save their own couch and a giant china hutch, which they carried in during the mall's opening hours. Quote, we avoided the night, explained Townsend, and we worked with the ebb and the flow of the mall. We were just a part of the living organism of its daily activities. Though the apartment had no running water, no refrigerator, and stolen electricity, the group made do, even thrived. Townsend and his friends, now the wardens of a super-secret mall apartment, lived in the space for weeks at a time, the mall providing a vibrant social life of shopping, food courts, even late-night movies at the Cineplex. They bought a PlayStation for entertainment and used mall bathrooms when nature called. For years, it was their secret spot and Townsend tells news sources that the group had grand plans to create a kitchen for the space, install wood flooring, and add a second bedroom. But those dreams would be cut short in 2007, as their mall hangout would become a bit more public than any of them ever thought. More after the break. Hi, Hi, I'm Angie Hicks, co-founder of Angie. When you use Angie for your home projects, you know all your jobs will be done well. Roof repair? Done well. Kitchen sink install? done well. Deck upgrades, done well. Electrical upgrade, done well. Angie's been connecting homeowners with skilled pros for nearly 30 years, so we know the difference between done and done well. Hire high-quality certified pros at Angie.com. You can host the best backyard barbecue when you find a professional on Angie to make your backyard the best around. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside. Repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. Hi, hello. How are you? Hello. How are you doing? Hello, hello, hello. Oh. Yeah. I'm, I don't know if you have lis- been listening to this episode. I assume so because you're right here. I'm a little congested. Did have COVID. Don't have COVID anymore. But still a little congested. And yet you press on. And yet I'm a, a brave soul. Y- and yet you brings podcast. brings art to the masses. And you <sighs> speak truth to power. <laughs> that too. That too. You're like, nothing will stop me from podcasting. They're like, nothing. maybe this is a sign. You- they're like, who cares? Yeah, no one no, asked. Yeah, no, st- or, or like, don't. I, my voice will be heard. And they're like, no, <laughs> by who? <laughs> yeah. By who? No one's here. Oh, by it. me later when I'm editing this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Torturing Jason. 
We want to say hello to anyone who's listening, supporting us, spreading the good word of Ghost Town. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And then here comes the <laughs> government <laughs> I strutting like down this one. the street, I looking cool. This is going to be a fun one for you. Full of attitude. <laughs> Our government uh, had a little history in retail, Did as they? a lot of us have. Hey, yes, absolutely. They worked at some stores at the mall. Mall stores. Ooh. Some you may remember, some you may not remember. So either you're going to feel really old or really young Mm. if you're like, I never heard of that and I never will. Or if you're like, oh, wow, that was that long ago. (laughs) So there's going to be there's going to be trauma for some and none for others. Confusion for others. Yeah, pretty much. No enjoyment. Just trauma or confusion. I hope you like dated references because they are coming right at you. Well, Someone who is a third key at a little store. I like to call learners. Remember learners? <laughs> no, I, don't, I also don't know what third key means. Oh, you know what a third key is? <laughs> no. Oh, see, I'm an old retail, <laughs> I'm an old retail head. You know, I I worked. I don't. Wow, I already. Feel I never had an education, confused. so I only did mm. this. Unless you count yeah. community college psychology, which I, I like I to use in this podcast as if I'm a, an authority. Yeah. Third key is uh, under assistant manager. Okay. You thought third key was like? Is it the third key to open a portal? Nope. I knew it had something to do with the structure or yeah. whatever, but I, I don't know that term. So okay. Learners is, a, I think, a clothing store primar- for women, I believe. It's Ooh. an old... In fact, the, this mall in uh, where I grew up in New- Newburgh, New York, I remember they pulled... T- where, uh, I saw a sign that was taken off, and one of the old signs in the back, probably from the 80s and early 90s, was Learners. Mm. Something to look up oh. for you. Uh, and uh, you can always ask Ashley Matson about that one. Ashley, tell me more. Here's another fashioned, Ooh. not nightmare store. One that I loved. I don't think you're going to have heard this one. If you have, very interesting. A little store called Merry Go Round. Nothing. Abs- uh, nothing. Nothing. Wow. I feel so young. Yeah. This is. I'm, I think so, probably most of the stores that you probably know are probably somewhat in existence still. Yeah, I think so. So this is just for this is for my Gen X people out there. Or older, I guess. Or hopefully younger. <laughs> Merry Go Round was, yeah, was like kind of like a rockin', like a rockin' cool store. Like I would be like, ooh, I need like a leather skinny tie. Oh. <laughs> well, a former third key of Merry Go Round is Matthew <laughs> Clemens Luray. Hello. Keep that store safe. I'm going to go another similar store. You definitely never heard of this one. It, it just popped into my head. Mm-hmm. These are ones you mm-hmm. should look up if you want to. Well, we, maybe we'll do episodes on them someday. Did someone die? Oh, them? yeah. God. Is any of them haunted? What happened? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did anyone go crazy? The corruption? Yeah. I'm sure there's all some sort of, especially in the malls in the 80s and stuff like that. I'm sure there's a lot of corruption, um, bad practices, and we hope there are so we can have content. Yeah, capitalize on their grief. This is another, I would say, another one that was for like, you know, some flammable clothes for men. Uh, oh, yeah. The name of the store, Chess King. <laughs> You know what it's like. <laughs> that does sound vaguely familiar. Um, was it a lot of like sweater, like yeah, like kind of like uh, upscale, Up- like sca- men's, like not formal, but like yeah. business casual stuff. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, of sweaters, like, squiggly lines, yep. weird fibers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's Chess King, and <laughs> and helming with third key in hand, Kelly Meehan. Wow, will they ever be second keys? Uh, no, that's why they they went for right for this to government. <laughs> uh, do you like to rock? I do like to rock. Oh, I enjoy then maybe rock. you want to know that this third key kept the tunes flowing at a little store called Sam Goody. Sam Goody. Okay, Goody got it. We're in. We're you in. You know that one. We're in. Eventually, we they're finally trying to hit it. the 80s. Yeah, it's like a lot of neon, <laughs> like everything's neon. Goody yeah. got it. A name that like doesn't Sam Goody doesn't really register music at all. No, not even a little bit. No. But they Sam Goody Goodwin, I'm sure, is the <laughs> name of the person. Uh, just keep and then you know they have like a little listening, Boots, little listening, yeah. yeah, to listen to tunes, a little stuff. sample yeah. some stuff, yeah. That you'd buy. I liked one song. I didn't like the other eleven, mm-hmm. but I'm stuck with this whole thing. Here we are. Let me get a cassette single, baby. <laughs> Third key in that store is Cat Chozelle. Hello. You want to get your video game on? You want to head on over to the arcade? 
Hell yeah. That's where all the all the guys and gals are getting the together. Gummy little yeah. control I know. buttons. Press the button, press the button. Sweaty, sweaty yeah. hands, pocket full of quarters. Yeah, absolutely. Pocket full of dreams. <laughs> A little place that I like to call, it might be regional, I don't know, Spaceport. Never heard of it. It kind of had like a facade of, I want to say, it's supposed to be like a, like a space station, but also kind of like a submarine from what I remember. That sounds very cool. It, it was. Yeah, it was a, it was a, cool, uh, it was a cool, cool place. Uh, a lot of dreams lived and died for me there. Mm. But uh, yeah, they had a third key. They had a third <laughs> key. It's Mercer Rothermel. Hello. I think they still are in existence. I don't think you like this one, if I remember correctly, because I do listen to what you say mostly. Cause Orange I, I, Julius. We're talking about Orange I Julius. Or- I, I, I was actually looking up the recipe for. Don't put cream for- with citrus. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I'm gonna have to like. I was looking at like the recipe for it because it is like Ugh. classic. I don't remember like loving it, but I remember walking past it, going, "Oh, I want this." In the same way, I'd put, <laughs> like a Cinnabon or. Uh-huh. or, or uh, Wetzel's pretzels, mm. kind of like, oh, I want this, but when I get it, do I really like it? Mm-hmm. Well, the, here comes the third key of jingling, <laughs> standing by the product, <laughs> Casey Weber. Hello. And our governor, mm. who said, malls, uh, how about a monopoly on them? How about I take yeah. them over? Our governor had a nickname, Westfield. <laughs> You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> oh, a little Westfield oh, shit. lineage, the mother of malls. Oh, yes, I mean, just when you see a Westfield, you're like, oh, this you're is like, good this sprung. is a big time. This is a good stores. This is in Italy, maybe. Yeah, we don't fucking know, but we know yeah. it's the best. And guess what? It'll have no nuance. No, <laughs> no. You don't the want charm nuance, is dead. Though. Yeah, the money is there. If they could just teleport you to the cash register <laughs> at every store and just ring you up for whatever the fuck they want you to have. Yeah. they would. But they can't. But they would. That would be our governor, a Westfield in lineage, Avian, Avian Noble. Noble. If you want no ads, no chit chat, bonus episodes, just the good stuff. Seven days free. Head on over to patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Let's go back mall. to Providence, Rhode Island for a different type of a mall experience. After years of furnishing and living comfortably in their secret apartment in the Providence Place Mall, Artist Michael Townsend and his friends would be infiltrated in 2007. One day, when some of the group entered the apartment, they found that someone had kicked in the door and stolen the PlayStation, along with several other personal items. Puzzlingly, the intruders had left some silverware and the television, which seemed odd for what the group guessed might have been a burglary. Of course, the incident spooked Townsend and his friends. Now, definitively, they knew someone knew of their apartment and that they could come back at any time. So they decided to create some new rules around the space. They decided that they would only stay there at night when the chances of being caught were low, as the mall was almost completely closed at that point, and they would never be there during the day. They would also double down on keeping the space a secret, something they promised each other from the very beginning. But soon they went a completely different direction, perhaps indignant about their breach in security. The members decided to try and live in the apartment full time for one year, but still staying scarce and out of the space during the day but still staying scarce and out of the space during the day. They figured out how to bring in a water tank and were in the process of constructing a full kitchen and a bathroom with a flush toilet. During this time, Townsend was hosting a visiting artist from Hong Kong and decided to show her the secret apartment, as a fellow artist might appreciate what they had done with the space. As they were leaving, however, Townsend and his friend heard the static buzz of something on the other side of the apartment's door. It was daytime, a risky time, as everyone affiliated with the apartment knew. The sound was a walkie-talkie. It turned out that the earlier break-in had been the work of two mall security guards who were monitoring the space and had taken the personal items in hopes of identifying whoever was in there. Now that Townsend was caught there during the day, it was all over. After being handed over to the police and interrogated, Townsend's friend was eventually let go. But Townsend himself was arrested and soon found himself standing in front of a judge in criminal court. Townsend insisted that, quote, the entire endeavor was done out of a compassion to understand the mall more and the life of a shopper. Of course, the mall was doing its own PR around the situation. Providence Place Mall spokesman Dante Bellini Jr. described the living space as little more than a, quote, area with stuff in it. 
But Providence Police Major Stephen Campbell said he and other detectives were so intrigued that they visited the apartment to see for themselves. Quote, I was surprised at what he was able to accomplish, Campbell said, clarifying, quote, but what he did was clearly criminal. The mall is private property. Townsend and all of his artist friends involved were each given a misdemeanor for trespassing, but the mall itself had effectively given them something worse, a lifelong banishment, an official letter stating that they could not come within a required distance of Providence Place Mall, effective immediately and in perpetuity. Now, nearly a decade later, Townsend still lives right near the mall, but of course he still can't go in. He even misses the mall in a way, which he at one point for these many years considered his home. Of course, if you're still listening, you can see how this story, however strange and even somewhat benign, is still being told, capturing the attention as a comment on gentrification, resourcefulness, and consumerism. Well, you are not alone. Townsend's story of, quote, developing the developer has piqued over 30 filmmakers' interests, including Jeremy Workman, who eventually made a film called Secret Mall Apartment about the space, with executive producer Jesse Eisenberg. The film premiered at South by Southwest this year to great interest and acclaim. Michael Townsend, now in his 50s, is still making art in the Providence area and around the world. He is a member of the Trummerkind Art Collective. On the collective's website, trummerkind.com, you can learn more about the secret apartment and also explore an art piece that is a fake real estate ad for the space. Trust me, it's very fun and really has helped me visualize the experience of living in this space as someone who is just a podcaster and researcher. I'm leaving you with a Daily Beast review of Secret Mall Apartment, the film, by Coleman Spildy, which is very reflective and evocative of the space itself. Quote, The film dexterously expands past all of its initial excitement when it illustrates precisely why this group of creative minds held such an affection for their clandestine condo. Director Jeremy Workman sews together a larger narrative that, at times, becomes unexpectedly moving. Yes, the Secret Apartment was a living, changing project, but it was also a place for people to come together and to plan more involved, important work together. Often, art reveals an even greater importance over time. By examining the effects of gentrification on a small scale and the need for artistic outlets in the face of strife, the secret mall apartment inside Providence Place finds a new significance 20 years after it was created. The documentary depicts the reptilian idea of progress, eating its tail, and in its final kicker, Secret Mall Apartment delivers one hilarious, nauseating gut punch that reaffirms its brilliance. (laughs) 